When Alex Krug was an executive at Behance, he noticed that quite a few tools had been developed to help encourage signups and help onboard customers. But once they were working with the product, there was very little help offered. This was a problem he thought he could help solve, which is why he founded Baton. Today, as the founder and CEO of Baton, Alex is helping people streamline their actual workflow with automation. And on this episode of IT Visionaries, he explains exactly what that looks like. Plus, he dives into his entrepreneurial journey and what it means to grow a company. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. This podcast is created by the team at mission.org. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, host of IT Visionaries. And today we have special guest, Alex. What is going on? Hey, Ian. Not too much, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. We are excited to talk to you today. You've worked at some companies that we use very regularly. And I am super excited to talk about what you're building now with Baton. So let's get into it. How did you get started in technology? Yeah, I got started in technology around 2008. And I was introduced to Scott Belsky and Matthias Correa, who founded Behance um, through one of our mutual friends, Michael Ventura. And Michael at the time, and I believe is still running a brand strategy agency called Subrosa. And at the time, I was representing creative talent and connecting them to opportunities at ad agencies, fashion brands, and design shops. And I was essentially doing the analog version of what Behance was building as a technology platform. You were part of the founding team at Behance. We all know later got acquired by Adobe, but tell us a little bit about the experience of of founding the company. Yeah, I joined Behance when we were a handful of folks. And at the time, Behance was a bootstrap company and really on this mission to empower the creative world, right? And so we thought of ourselves as a mission-centric, medium agnostic company. And we were serving this mission in a variety of ways. We had the 99U, which is an event series and a blog that really focused on creatives executing on their ideas versus just sort of coming up with more and more ideas, which is pretty easy for creatives to do. We also had the action method, which was a daily task manager for creative professionals. And then the Behance Network, which was the platform to showcase and discover creative work. So we really were serving this mission in a variety of ways and over a course of you know, many years and in a bootstrap fashion. And years later, we ended up raising venture capital from Union Square Ventures. And you know, the Adobe relationship actually transpired quickly after that capital raise. So we'd always had a relationship with Adobe and thinking about sort of a stars align acquirer when you're building a startup and sort of a perfect match. Adobe was that for us. And you know, we were making the decision to sell the business to Adobe and just sort of thinking about this team that we had put together, this mission that we were serving, and Adobe coming in as a partner allowed us to continue to serve the mission and just at a greater scale and impact to the creative community. So it was a no-brainer. And if you think about where Adobe was when we were acquired, they were one of the early pioneers in making the transition from a box software company to a subscription business. And we were there at that specific inflection point in their business. And we just were a natural fit. You know, thinking about the creative community and the ecosystem that we built, we slotted in just seamlessly into their ecosystem as a, as a business. And you know, when we were acquired, we were around a million members. And last I checked, Behance was 21 million members. Um, so just an incredible team, company, and experience all around. And were there any moments there where, you know, from the technology side and what you all were building, you know, creatives are not to say, you know, anti-technology because with all the, you know, advent of of many different technologies, it's been, you know, a, a boom for creators in that way. But, you know, it's so difficult to master all the technology, to master all of those things you know, for creators who might be, you know, analog or might be, uh, you know, some other kind. Was that kind of a challenge blending, you know, seamless technology with the creator ecosystem? 
Yeah, I think definitely the early days of figuring out how to serve the community, we learned a lot. And creatives, I think by nature, are just not really great self promoters. So we had to figure out within the platform how to make it easy for them and how to showcase value very quickly to be discovered by folks that aren't already in their network, right? Creatives are really good at sort of talking to their friends, their parents, their people in their you know, immediate network about what they're up to. But sort of this idea of selling their creativity always doesn't feel natural. So, you know, we struggled with that early, but I think we figured out a few unique ways to do it. And one of the ways, just to sort of getting Behance off the ground, you know, I remember us focusing on just things that didn't scale long term in the business, which I think is so important as, as these things get started. And in the process of Behance, we would go out and sort of Scott or Matthias or Will or Zach or these people at Behance would go sort of say, hey, our personal creative network, would you guys join this platform? And we would do a lot of the heavy lifting for them. We would get their images. We would upload them to Behance and sort of showcase in an ideal format how the platform would really serve them. And so just the heavy lift, um, sort of taking the burden off the individuals and not expecting all of the early iterations of the technology to do all the work, I think was one of those things that um, I've applied and I've just seen applied at, at many of the early stage startups to get these things off the ground. You can't just rely on the software to do the heavy lift. And, and a lot of those learnings have come over time. And then building the product, how did you look at like, what was the, the technology landscape that you had in the organization? Was it just, you know, a handful of, of developers heads down or how did you look at that? Yeah, we, ha- we built all of the technology at Behance in-house. You know, I think that having a team that's committed you know, and really thinking about the end customer day-to-day and making things you know, when something didn't work, you course correct and you pivot. So building technology in-house was always something we believed in and continue to do at our current company, Baton. So yeah, it was, you know, we'd try something, go back to our customers, watch the data, watch the way they use the product and make things uh, move very quickly based on what we were seeing in the product. Yeah, let's get into Baton. Um, I, I want to talk about some of your you know, entrepreneurial endeavors here. But I think it, it, for our audience who doesn't know about Baton, you know, obviously a very new company. Why did you start this? Yeah. So while I was at Adobe and some other tech companies I've been lucky enough to be a part of throughout my career, I started to notice operational debt and sort of practices that didn't scale when building these businesses and watching these businesses grow. That was coupled with a venture capital environment where there's been plenty of it over the past kind of five to seven years. And I just saw my entrepreneurial friends and entrepreneurs throwing bodies at at problems. And the issue is when you throw bodies at these problems, uh, the solution actually hinders the scale, you know, causes inefficient growth and, you know, worse off causes high burn growth. So Baton was really born out of that observation and pain. How can companies scale core functions like implementation that they can't live without, but without bloating the team and or organization? So if you think about where Baton sits, you look at the sales process. It's managed very well through Salesforce and other CRMs. And once the customer is live, the customer success platforms do a great job of managing retention. But at the moment you win a new customer, which is their first impression kind of post-sale, They're welcomed to a set of hacked together general project management tools. Here's a little bit of email and mixed with some static spreadsheets. And you just showed the customer this beautiful piece of software. But the first impression they now get is a janky spreadsheet. And they just don't understand. So this obviously doesn't provide an ideal customer experience. They end up churning. Projects traditionally go over budget. Sometimes they actually never end up going live and you're stuck with shelfware, which isn't good for anybody. So these spreadsheets and current project management tools just don't scale. They end up getting more and more complicated as you grow sales. They end up hurting companies' long-term growth. So we started Baton to really solve this problem. And so who are the folks at companies that you're working with? Who are the kind of early adopters of Baton? Yeah, we're working with a variety of folks across the board from folks who run implementation and professional services and customer success executives all the way up to you know, the management layer of a company because they really see this as a problem, right? If you look at implementation on a quarterly or monthly or weekly basis when you're doing status updates, you're saying, okay, we booked all this revenue, but why is you know, one fourth of it or half of it sort of stuck in implementation? And then people start asking questions around, well, where is it stuck and why is it stuck? 
and everybody's referring to static spreadsheets and nobody has a good answer and nobody knows how to quickly contextualize where things have gone off track and how to re, you know, sort of configure and get the thing, you know, moving towards a completion for a live customer. So we just see this time and time again, and the people we talk to had different ways of describing it, but it was a universal problem across the board. So as you're having these conversations, is it clear that there's a solution out there that they need? Or is it just kind of conversations around like, ah, this is all super confusing and annoying and, and frustrating? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? I think uh, we started having these conversations with the general thesis observation and pain that the founding team of this business at Baton had generally experienced throughout our careers. And like I said, we've leaned into it. Everybody sort of had a, the same problem, but described it differently. And, you know, we've noticed like, you know, well-known Silicon Valley executives and startup founders like Mark Andreessen have said, software is eating the world, right? But what we noticed is sort of this poor planning and processes keep getting in the way. So before we even started Baton or put any code down, we interviewed over 100 startup execs. And we really heard these problems time and time again. So if you think about Baton and where we sit, everybody involved in these implementation projects is on the same page from day one throughout the process. They get updates in real time. There's no more sort of updating static spreadsheets, chasing down stakeholders internally and externally. The platform we've built is like, very specifically defined and designed for this workflow. And another way to think about it is a multi sort of org collaboration tool that provides a level of accountability, management, and transparency for all parties involved that has never existed before. Our clients can share status updates with one click of a button on a Zoom call with everybody. They can see where things are going to be late. They can see what's holding it up, who is responsible, and what they can do, and most importantly, is reassign things, get things back on track. The executive team knows where things are stuck. And with one click of a button, what we keep seeing is people were creating project plans for implementations that were, they were doing time and time again. So we have templates where you can just recreate these in a click. So just speeding up the process across the board from creation to getting things back on track to that time that's so crucial from bookings to billings when you're getting through an implementation process, we're solving at the time. So for our audience, many CIOs are evaluating technologies constantly, asking for recommendations, asking for these sort of things. As someone who has used a bunch of technologies in, in your career and also created some, like what would be kind of the points like as, as you're talking to a CIO of like, what would be the headache that this could uh, alleviate for them? Yeah. So in thinking about where the CIO sits, you know, you're, you're buying all of this technology and you see your organization purchasing new technology. But the, the reality is a lot of the technology that's being purchased is, you know, great. There's a relationship between a salesperson and a client champion who ultimately says, hey, there's an ROI. They go get buy-in from the executive team that we need to purchase this software. And what CIOs keep, you know, saying to us is, look, it's great to have new software. It's great to power our business through all these new tools, but we see a lot of these tools actually get delayed and never go live. And by the time they actually go live, the team's turned over maybe a couple of times. It's sort of lost steam uh, in delivering the ROI because it got stuck in implementation for too long. So we, we really think it's about getting that you know, promise of the customer, what you've sold, and getting a customer live quicker and just in a more real-time sort of transparent way as to people know where things are going well, know where things are going off track. Because if you've ordered anything, you've ordered food, it, you've ordered a, you know, something off of Amazon or whatever, you see something go wrong. But that sense of like knowing what happened and why it's delayed is so important in the customer experience. And whereas today, really, it's kind of a black box as to people arguing over these uh, you know, weekly stand-ups and spreadsheets. And we just kept seeing that time and time again. So I think we're solving that for the CIOs to understand what softwares are going live, why, and, you know, where things are held up for them. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, we talk a lot about those build or buy decisions, those times where you have to figure out what your plan is going to be. What is your five-year plan? What are the things that we know we're going to have to rip out? Or what are the things that we're just not using? And if you can go to the CIO and or the, if the CIO can go to the CFO and say, Hey, you know, this is how we're using, you know, these technologies X, Y, and Z to actually be productive. That's a huge value add. It's a huge help. 
Yeah, I, I think, and, and the CIOs also want to know, you know, where things are stuck, right? Like if you're looking at technology you're using, I think it's a great point. So, yeah. And so, you know, in managing software implementation, can you get into some of the inner workings of the platform and some of the stuff that's under the hood? Yeah. I mean, on the collaborative side of how we built the product, you know, it's really one of these things where the early pain point was observed by customer interactions from my career. And, you know, we've continued that in the process we're doing today. So we continually, you know, are tweaking the product, getting customer feedback, understanding the profile of our customer, what we're building long term. And that is just, you know, crucial at the early stages of the business and really keeping the feedback loops going on a consistent basis with our early customers and, you know, internalizing what they're saying, how they're using it, and sort of how we're prioritizing our product roadmap is day to day, kind of how we think about product building. I want to go back to just some of the broader entrepreneurial lessons. We have a lot of listeners who are, you know, technologists or IT folks that are building things on the side or looking to start companies. Obviously, you know, from your career, you've kind of seen things happening in the companies that you were working at and then kind of said, hey, that, you know, this doesn't scratch the itch here. There's something missing. You know, as you were starting to think about product development or setting up a creating company, what were some of the things that, you know, you were doing in the early process, like building a team and all of that? Yeah. So with Baton, we're super lucky. A lot of the team that we founded the company with has worked together for years. And the folks that we brought on to complement that team early, they brought on a couple of folks uh, with them from previous experiences. So there's a lot of muscle memory in this team at the outset, where you know without previous entrepreneurial experiences or company building experiences, that's pretty tough. But I think one of the just general takeaways is just how important those folks are and focusing on people, whether it's your team and customers and ultimately product, obviously. But these things are important early and they continue to be the most important things as the company grows. And one of my favorite learnings from my former colleague and friend, Scott Belsky, and he's talked a lot about this publicly, is if you're on a mission that's of importance and you can keep the team together long enough to figure it out, I think that's just an incredible thing that holds true across all the great companies I've been fortunate enough to be a part of in my career as an operator, advisor, or an investor. And just lastly, like that notion of a North Star, you know, something you're driving towards as individuals and as a team. I don't think every company has this big, bold, grand mission, but absolutely every company can have a culture of shared goals. And that's incredibly important as you navigate the startup journey. Yeah. And as, you know, as an advisor to other companies and, and being a mentor with startups, like any kind of lessons learned that you see folks kind of mess up in the early days? No, I think, you know, if I think back to my own experiences at, you know, Behance and Baton and some other companies in between, I don't think there are like super specific mistakes, but I see a lot of folks, and I've been, you know, guilty of this along with teams I've worked with, is just delaying decisions, right? You wait for more and more data at the early stages and sometimes and likely that data never really comes. So you get a concrete decision. So I would just say making decisions earlier than probably feels comfortable and getting to that decision right or wrong and course correcting from there. You know, ultimately a lot of that has to do with just kind of an experiencing that. At Baton, we've really adopted writing things down early and often. I think the writings that we share as a team really allow us to compound the value of those writings as we bring people on, as we debate topics around where the business is going, how we're thinking about products. So a culture of writing things down. And as I said earlier, just you know, continuously communicating with clients in these early portions of the business and just they are extension of the company and keeping them involved early and often is just incredibly important. And as I think about like early successes for Behance. I know that was a a thought there around, you know, we used to Google Behance and it would say, do you mean Beyonce? Because Behance obviously is a made up term. And one of the early wins was when Google actually recognized us as a company. So that was super fun. And, you know, one of the, one of the takeaways from, from growing the business there. And, you know, another one was we had the opportunity to power iconic institutions like RISD and SCAD and the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum's portfolio systems. So those were like some early fun wins uh, through that Behance experience as well. 
Yeah, we were talking before this about how I've got multiple designers off of Behance. It's a great platform and it's something that, uh, you know, it's funny when you look at technology and like couldn't really imagine how you would do things before. Like, I don't even know how I would have found a designer before things like that existed, right? It's like, how would you even, especially at like the speed that you can do that stuff. And it's funny when I launched some of the artwork that we had created, people were like, where did you find that designer? Like, how did you even know? Like, what did you even do? I'm like, oh yeah, just go to this website. It's great. But it, isn't it just kind of like funny that, you know, it can create this new normal, uh, specifically like around, around Behance and this community of folks who just didn't really have the searchability or the findability unless, you know, they had a, a robust website or something. Yeah. And if you think back to when the Behance experience started, like with Scott Matias, you know, and that sort of back in the day, you know, creatives were just sort of, you know, they knew who they knew and they'd send their portfolio around to potentially talent reps or just their own personal network. And now, you know, the platform really allows folks like yourself and people all over the world to find designers, creatives, photographers that might be in a small town sort of in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. I grew up there. So, you know, just thinking about how that connectivity through Behance and other platforms like it can facilitate, you know, changing somebody's career and life, right? Like they are found by a company that needs a designer that becomes their first gig or, you know, just sort of changes their trajectory. So it's super incredible just to watch and how you can get specific if you're looking for a specific style. And, you know, we've seen that time and time again through the platform. And, and one of the reasons that was such an exciting experience was just you got to see talent connecting with opportunity at scale. And there was no sort of middle person brokering those deals. It was, hey, we're looking for talent, creatives looking for opportunity, and a marriage you know, happens pretty naturally over the, the platform. So incredible and it's still happening today. Yeah. And you know, technology also aids in helping them get paid and all that sort of stuff. Like it's, it's amazing, you know, having just the access to the designer, it's like, it's part of it. But then now you can you know, you can use PayPal, you can use all sorts of different things to make these kind of things. Our designers in Romania and, uh, you know, it's just things like that that are so cool. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, technology is facilitating a lot of things that used to be just sort of a pain in the neck for everybody involved. And so, you know, whether it's discovering, getting paid for the work, getting the full commission and not having, you know, three people in between the transaction, between the opportunity and the creative is, is just incredible to see. So what's next for Baton? What do you have uh, in the works? Yeah, Baton just is hyper-focused on implementation. I think there's temptation to try and boil the ocean with the variety of opportunities and directions we could go. And truthfully, we just see a massive opportunity if we continue to stay in our lane. We've already seen our customers get their customer live twice as fast with Baton, and we're seeing customer retention numbers go through the roof. So we're just on this trend of the reality of software is it will permeate every industry, large and small, over the next 10 years. And we think in the near future, it's going to sound irresponsible to deploy your product or implement your software without using Baton. And so with our company, you know, we're leveraging just years of work that we collectively have in SaaS to create this truly unique experience for implementation and customer success professionals that allows companies to move deals from book to build in an accelerated, scalable, and ultimately predictable fashion. So that's where we're going to stay for a while. The opportunity, as I said, is just massive. So we're heads down on that. So what does the future of Baton look like in the next five years? Yeah, in the future, we see a world where companies will become Baton verified. So they deliver on time and on budget, and there's a measurable component to that guarantee that they're giving to their customer that they will ultimately be able to deliver their product in a predictable fashion. So, you know, this notion of us becoming the single source of truth for implementation and the system of record is within our site. And we're super excited about the next five years. Is there anything about the current state of technology that's particularly exciting for you? Yeah, when I look at kind of what's happening in the technology world, I'd argue we could be in the golden age, it's, though it continually feels like that. And there's more software and more companies building better and more beautiful products. Yet that time to realize the value is so long. So mostly because as software gets into more and more 
legacy industries, it has to tie into these bigger systems. So I'm excited for the day when the time to value for a new piece of technology is almost instantaneous as platforms like Baton become true infrastructure. Are there any things that like particularly you see as like that thing that everybody uses or a lot of people use that's just going to get kind of like, you know, upgraded and upgraded? Like it seems like we just have so many tools right now and the interplay between those tools is changing pretty rapidly. But like you had kind of mentioned earlier, you know, there's still so much that is being done in spreadsheets or being done, you know, non-collaboratively or kind of just being lost in the sauce. Like, do you, do you see that there's any sort of ways that technology becomes, you know, a little more seamless? Yeah, I think right now, you know, it's siloed technologies that kind of don't plug into others that play nicely in the sandbox, if you will. I think that's going to become a thing of the past. If you're working in things that are static, that aren't updating in real time, that people can't from different stakeholders' points of view, peer into and get value from immediately, I think those things are going away rapidly. So just a continued trend there as things move forward. And then what about, you know, with the creative industry? How do you think that'll change or how has it changed over the years? Yeah, within the creative industry, it's super exciting for creatives. I would argue they're no longer at the mercy of the former gatekeepers that previously existed. You know, they can create these opportunities and connect directly with their fans and customers across platforms and really build their careers as they'd like to. And the creative seat at the leadership table will continue to increase as it's one of the last things probably that will never be able to be automated or commoditized. So I believe creativity is the differentiator for all great companies and really will continue to be going forward. Well, I think, you know, part of the thing with creatives is that they can be exponentially better than each other in certain ways, right? And I think that that's really hard to understand. Like we know that like a programmer can be exponentially better than their peers. But for creatives, like I think a lot of people just see, you know, it's like plug and play sort of stuff. And I think that like the exceptional ones, I mean, take a random example, but like, you know, Banksy, for example, you know, it's like people have these certain types of creatives that are so good, but yet, you know, it was so hard to be found earlier. And I I just think it's like, how much boring stuff is there out there? And it's like, especially if you're looking at like B2B companies or things like that, and you have this army of creatives that you could throw at some and and make things a lot more beautiful, a lot cooler, a lot more engaging, a lot, you know, better UI. And yet kind of, we just haven't really done it yet. And I'm, I'm excited to see all those things change and to bring more creatives into the business world. Yeah. Creatives are, you know, driving this experience around the blend of what, you know, customers expect in their sort of consumer apps, whether it's Instagram or, you know, these, these shiny new apps that everybody's using. And you look at sort of old school B2B technology and that expectation around, you know, customer experiences first and foremost through beautiful design, through beautiful UI and UX is really going to be the standard going forward. Those old school sort of flat <laughs> looking businesses uh, in B2B software are a thing of the past where the worlds are going to blend quite seamlessly going forward. Okay, let's get into our lightning round. These questions are fast and easy. Just like the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience, you can go to salesforce.com slash platform to learn more. We love Salesforce. They've been with us since the very beginning. Check out Salesforce Customer 360 platform, salesforce.com slash platform. Lightning round questions, Alex. Are you ready? Let's do it. Number one, what app on your phone is the most fun? Instagram. What hobby or habit did you pick up during shelter in place? Uh, my running habit, continuing my running habit day to day. It's one of those things that's uh, kept me active, kept me sane through this whole experience that we're all going through. Do you have a hidden talent or passion? Hidden talent or passion? I would argue my passions and talents are on full display for anybody interested. As I mentioned, Instagram, it's mostly pictures of my kids and running. So that's, that's there for anybody who wants to enjoy that. What is your best advice for a first-time CEO? Yeah, I'm actually going through my first experience as a CEO. So I would just say, you know, if you've had other experiences in your career, looking at those experiences that were done well through potential leaders you worked for or worked with, and you know, taking from those experiences what you are now in a position to create for your team. 
So I internalized a lot of those experiences and have hopefully brought a great experience for our team and continuing to learn from other CEOs I respect. So I think it's a kind of pick and choose a menu of your past experiences, hopefully leaving out the bad and doubling down on the good experiences and leaders you've worked with previously. Do you have any questions that you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? Do I have any questions that I've never been asked that I wish I got asked more often? I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I get lots of questions. So uh, the want for more questions is uh, I'm good there. <laughs> Touche. Well, Alex, that's all we got. Thanks for joining today. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Any, uh, any final thoughts? Anything to plug? No, I think uh, we're doing some exciting stuff at Baton. So check out Baton at hellobaton.com. And yeah, stay tuned as we're on our way to becoming the system of record for implementation. Thanks so much, Ian. Thanks again. Take care. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. <laughs>